Welcome to a reading from the Library of Historical Apologetics. Lydia and I thought that it might be of interest to some of you to hear some passages from some of our favorite pieces of historical work. There have been wonderful defenders of the Christian faith for many centuries, and this is our opportunity to bring to you a few of the gems that we've unearthed in the past couple of decades of research in this area. Today's reading is coming from the work of the English logician, philosopher, and theologian Richard Waitley, who was an Oxford professor and Anglican Archbishop of Dublin. Waitley wrote many works. This reading is taken from his introductory lectures on morals and Christian evidences from the edition published three years before his death in 1860. The topic is what Waitley called the fallacy of objections, and in this introductory work, Waitley attempts to give advice to a young Christian who has not had time to study comprehensively the evidences of Christianity. He's already gone over some of those evidences, and now he turns his attention to the question of objections. The reading begins at Lesson 13. The chapter is Objections, and it begins on page 271. As there are persons who reject the Christian religion, you may perhaps suppose that they have undertaken to refute the proofs of it, and that they have found answers such as satisfy themselves to the evidences and reasons on which it is believed, or at least to some of the principle of the reasons such as have been just put before you. But you are not likely to meet with anyone who will undertake this. At least no such attempt has been made in any book that has been hitherto published. Unbelievers though they have had nearly 18 centuries to try, have never yet been able to show, nor have they even attempted to show, how it could be that so many marks of truth should be found in the gospel history, supposing it to be false. Of these marks of truth, even that portion, though far short of the whole, which have been just laid before you, are such as certainly never met together, at least in any known false story and how it is that they are found in the gospel history, if that be not true, has never been explained. No one has ever explained in what way the first disciples of Jesus, circumstanced as they were, succeeded or could have succeeded in propagating, as we know they did, such a religion as theirs, supposing it to be not from God, but from man. And yet, many persons have written and spoken against Christianity. How, then, have they proceeded? Instead of accounting for the introduction of Christianity by natural causes, and on the supposition of its being a mere human device, they are accustomed to put forward various difficulties and start objections against several points in the religion. And unlearned Christians often find themselves hard-pressed with these objections and suppose that they are called upon either to find answers to everything that can be urged against the Christian religion and give a satisfactory solution of every difficulty that is pointed out, or else to abandon their faith, or at least confess that they cannot defend it. Now, you have indeed been taught that it is a Christian's duty to be ready to give an answer to every one that asks a reason of the hope that is in you. But this is a very different thing from being prepared to answer every objection. If a person asks you why you are a Christian, or on what grounds you may call on a pagan to embrace Christianity, this is quite a different thing from asking you how can you explain this? And how do you reconcile that? And how do you remove such and such difficulties? I am not saying, you will observe, that no such questions as these ought ever to be asked, or that there is no occasion to seek answers to them, but only that they are not at all the same thing as the other question, the inquiry for a reason of our Christian hope. And it should also be observed that it is not the most natural and reasonable way of examining any question to begin with looking to the objections against any system or plan or history before we inquire into the reasons in its favor. And yet it is thus that some people are apt to proceed in the case of the Christian religion, having been brought up in it from childhood and received it merely as the religion of their fathers, they perhaps meet with someone who starts objections against several points, and then they think themselves obliged to find an answer to each objection and to explain every difficulty in the gospel system without having begun by learning anything of the positive evidence on which it is founded. And the end of this sometimes is that their minds are disturbed and perhaps their faith overthrown 
before they have even begun to inquire into the subject in the right way. Some persons will advise you, for fear of having your mind thus unsettled, to resolve at once never to listen to any objections against Christianity, or to make any inquiries, or to converse at all on the subject with anyone who speaks of any doubts or difficulties, but to make up your mind once for all to hold fast the faith you have been brought up in on the authority of wiser men than yourself, and never attend to any reasoning on the subject. You have already seen that if our forefathers had gone upon this plan, we should, at this day, have been pagans like them and that if all the world had proceeded thus when the apostles first appeared, all men would have kept to the religion of their fathers, as the chief part of the most learned and most powerful among them did see 1 Corinthians one twenty three, And Christianity would not have existed at all. And you ought to observe also that when a learned man says that ordinary Christians had better shut their ears against all doubts and arguments and be satisfied to take the word of the learned for the truth of the religion, a suspicion is often raised that he does not really believe it himself, but wishes to support it for the sake of the lower classes, and considers that the less they think and reason and inquire, the less danger there is of their being undeceived. Such appears to have been generally the state of the mind of the educated classes among the ancient heathens in respect to their religion. They thought it useful for the vulgar to believe in the fables about their gods, and being aware that these would not stand the test of examination, they did not approve of any inquiry on the subject. But it is likely that many of those who discourage ordinary Christians from using their reason on the subject of Christian evidences are not themselves unbelievers, but are merely timorous and distrustful, and see the dangers on one side while they overlook those on the other. They see that there is a danger of men making an ill use of their reason, which there certainly is, as well as of any other gift. The servant in the parable, Matthew twenty five twenty five, Luke nineteen twenty, who was entrusted with one talent, might have employed it ill and lost it, but it was not therefore the safe course to lay it by in a napkin. There is danger of the misuse of money or of food. We know that many shorten their lives by intemperance, yet food was bestowed for the support of life and not for its destruction. And so also God has provided evidence to prove the truth of Christianity and has given us the faculty of reason by which we can understand that evidence. And what is more, he has expressly directed us, 1 Peter 3.15, to make that use of the faculty. But in the use of all his gifts, there is danger, which we cannot escape without diligent caution. And those who would guard men against the danger of doubt and disbelief by discouraging the use of reason are creating a much greater danger of the same kind by the distrust which they manifest, by appearing to suspect that their religion will not stand inquiry. But is it then to be expected that you should be prepared to answer every objection that may be brought against your religion? By no means. You may have very good reason for believing something against which there are many objections, and objections which you cannot answer for want of sufficient knowledge of the subject. In many other cases besides that of religion, there will be difficulties on both sides of the question which even the wisest man cannot clear up, though he may, perhaps, plainly see on which side the greater difficulties lie, and may even see good reason for being fully satisfied which ought to be believed. Thus in the case before mentioned of the bed of seashells found far above the present level of the sea, there are strong objections against supposing either that the sea was formerly much higher than now, or that those beds were so much lower and were heaved up many hundred feet to the height where they now lie. And yet, no one who has examined and inquired into the subject has any doubt that those beds of shells do exist, and must at some former time have been the bottom of a sea. To take another instance, the astronomer Copernicus first taught, about 300 years ago, that the earth, which had formerly been supposed to be at rest in the midst of the universe with all the heavenly bodies moving round it, travels round the sun in the course of a year, and is, at the same time, turning also on its own axis, that is, rolling over like a ball, every 24 hours. This theory of his, which has long since been universally admitted, was at first met by many objections, several of which neither he nor anyone else in those days was able to answer. Many years afterwards, when astronomy was better understood, some objections were answered and difficulties explained, but there were others of which no explanation could be found till a very short time ago, in the memory of many persons now living. Yet, before that time, notwithstanding the objections, there was no one at all acquainted with the subject who had any doubt of the earth's motion. 
Again, it is perfectly well established that aerolites, that is, stones from the sky, have fallen in various countries and at different times to a considerable number. They are composed of iron, or a peculiar kind of iron stone, and are of all sizes from a few ounces to several hundredweight. No explanation has been given of them that is at all satisfactory. There are strong objections against supposing them either to have been thrown out by volcanoes in the moon, or to be fragments torn off from some other planets, or to be formed in the air. In future generations, perhaps when chemistry and astronomy are much improved, more may be known about these wonderful stones. But in the meantime, the fact of their having fallen is so well attested by numerous witnesses that, in spite of all the difficulties, no one who has inquired into the subject has any doubt. The thing has really occurred, however incredible it might have appeared. Then again, if we look to human transactions, we shall find several portions of history, even those which no one has any doubt of, full of such strange events that difficulties might be pointed out in the accounts of them, and strong objections raised against the history even when it rests on such satisfactory evidence as to be believed in spite of those objections. In the history, for instance, of Europe for the last forty years, there are many events so improbable in themselves, especially all that relate to the wonderful rise and greatness and overthrow of the empire of Napoleon Bonaparte, that it would be easy to find objections sufficient to convince many persons that the history could not be true, were it not that it is so well attested as to be believed, notwithstanding all the difficulties. Numberless other examples might be brought to show how many things there are which men believe, and believe on very good grounds, in spite of strong and real objections, which they cannot satisfactorily answer, these being outweighed by more and greater difficulties on the opposite side. As for the particular objections which have been brought against the Christian religion and the Christian scriptures, it would, of course, be impossible to put before you in a short compass even the chief part of them together with the answers that have been given. But what is of the most importance is to lay down generally the right way of viewing objections, either against our religion or against anything else. Namely, first, that you should not begin by considering the objections to any statement or system before you are acquainted with the evidence in favor of it. And secondly, that you should not think yourself bound to renounce your faith if you cannot answer every objection and clear up every difficulty that may be raised, but should remember that many things are believed and must be believed against which there are strong objections that have never been completely answered when there are stronger objections against the opposite belief. This has been a reading from the Library of Historical Apologetics. I'm Tim McGrew.